It's time for the Access of Easy podcast, the weekly technology digest that keeps you ahead of the curve. Brought to you by EasyDNS.com. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Access of Easy. This is number 341. My name is Joey, and the other panel is Len, buddy. What's going on over there? How the heck are you? Great shirt, Mario. That's uh, Is that your no, March 10th homage there? Are you a couple days late, but I, I think maybe you're paying homage. No, it, I'm just in the rotation. I like this shirt. This is a, uh, more of a vintage one. It's a, you know what? It's a Paper Mario version now that I think you, about did it. Did you like Paper Mario? Are you a Paper Mario guy? Yeah, the original yeah? for sure. The Origami King that came on in the Switch was not really. It was, and I got that one too. Mm. No, it, it had these like mini games. That's how you beat the, the the bosses and stuff. It wasn't very good in that regards. But the story was all right. Mm. There was actually one part in the game. The story is like I was blown away at what happened. I don't want to spoil it, but there was one particular moment. It was like, wow, why did you do this? And yeah, and it, very rarely do like, I have that moment in Mario games. Yeah, I, I'm like in the market for a great, like a high quality long Mario RPG game. Mario RPG that came over Super Nintendo. I still remember this. My brother and I went to the store to buy an NBA game at Toys R Us when we were kids. I must have been like, I don't know, nine or 10 maybe. And they didn't have anything there. And we ended up buying Mario RPG for unknown reasons. I have no idea why I bought it. I had never played an RPG in my life. My brother and I had to agree on a game, which was hard enough as it is. And we ended up buying Mario RPG for, I think, Len, $25 at the time. You know, if we want to talk about inflation over the years. And that game, if you haven't played Mario RPG, I think that's one of the best five games Nintendo has ever made. If you haven't played it, if anyone listening, watching is a Nintendo new game. Nintendo has ever it, made? Yeah, Nintendo has ever made. That's one of the best five games. Story, gameplay, just quality of content. And it's only about, if I had to guess, if you really tried to finish it 100%, it's probably 20 hours, 25 hours maybe, max. So, Ocarina of Time... Breath of the Wild. Yeah. Um, Link to the Past, I'm going to throw in there. You throw in whatever you want. It's a top five game. It's better than any Pokemon game. I think for my money, especially at the time with the graphics, it was one of the first like 3D kind of overhead walk around games. It was a uh, pseudo 3D. It was like a three exactly. quarter. I don't know what to call I don't know what to call it. Yeah. What do you call that? Three, angle? three quarter like, overhead. Yeah. It's like kind of over the shoulder, but not quite. Um it's it's really good. I highly recommend. If you haven't played it, I highly recommend it. And I, like you especially, I would assume you you would have played it. But I guess not. I have played it. It was a long time ago. I'll be honest. It was in an emulator form. It was it was okay. I mean, SquareSoft was the people behind it, and they yeah. are very good at making those games. Final yes, Fantasy, it, right? Yeah. Yeah, Final Fantasy two II and three, or four and six, and the rest of the world. Those were epic games as well. So, um, yeah. I mean, it's you're just moving chess pieces to figure out which is the the best game out there. But the ones I mentioned in terms of like the best Nintendo games, um, yeah, the Zelda, Breath of the Wild, Ocarina of Time. I'm even gonna go link to the past, man. What a great game! But yeah, yeah maybe maybe Mario RPG, maybe one of the um, Mario Karts. Um, yeah, they're good. I, I just, I mean, this is off the beaten path here. I just wonder why Nintendo hasn't used that IP more, the Mario RPG IP and that style of game. It's super popular. They just re-released it on Switch and it did gangbusters. And uh, I didn't buy it. I, like I, I'm, I'm kind of true to the old format. But my brother did. He said he loved it. Said it was really good. And some extra content there apparently as well. So anyway, they had to make an agreement with Square. Formerly yeah. SquareSoft, now Square. Yeah, that's probably right. Actually, you're probably right about that. Um, okay, so anyway, this is number 341. Like we said, don't forget sign up for the podcast wherever you get your podcast. Sign up for the newsletter accessvz.com, and uh, you can get Mark and Jones weekly. Uh, newsletter on data breach and overreach and all the latest and greatest there. Last week's quote, Len, if you could kick the person in the pants responsible for the most for most of your trouble, you wouldn't sit for a month. That was by Theodore Roosevelt and Andy got it. So congrats to Andy. This week's quote, it's only because of their stupidity that they're able to be so sure of themselves. If you know who that's by, put it at the bottom of this post in the comment section. No Googling, no looking it up. You guys know the rules. And the winner gets uh, their next domain renewal on easy dns which is great so this week we got five stories here uh, a couple of them are real dingers and uh the others i wasn't sure about until i got the newsletter but uh let's get into them yeah uh, they're all dingers because we have a the u.s cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency 
This is a federal agency in charge of cybersecurity in the U.S. Well, they found out they were hacked back in February. And I feel oh so much safer knowing that they are there to protect our cybersecurity. And given what's happened, it's well, I'm not sure exactly how safe we really are. Well, this agency has had to take extreme measures as a result of this breach. And they unplugged two of their key systems as a precaution. And these systems include an infrastructure protection. This is IP gateway, which houses critical information about the interdependency of U.S. infrastructure. Hmm. That's pretty nasty. And the other one pretty is important. Yep. chemical security assessment tool. as a CSAT, which houses private sector chemical security plans. And another one that if this goes pretty bad, because CSAT, they have some of the, the country's most sensitive industrial information, including the top screening tool for high risk chemical facilities. So if something happens to that, people nearby, it's going to be absolutely wrecked. And so a spokesperson for the agency indicated that there is, quote, no operational impact at this time. And they say they are working to upgrade and modernize their systems. The question I'd ask, like, why wasn't this not mo modernized before? <laughs> like, what does it take away from this statement? Seriously, what is it? It sounds like that they were lax in terms of updating their systems and keeping it old. I understand legacy systems is difficult to upgrade. But given the critical importance of these, they should have put more effort, more resources into getting this done. And now they're forced to do so. They say that the breach impacted only these two systems, the ones that, which they took online. And well, as a result, because these were running older technology, and that's the result of this hack. And the government is not still, they're not certain who is behind the attack. But given that this agency runs a program that allows federal, state, local officials to share cybersecurity and physical security assessment tools. To be honest, it could be just about anybody who attacked this and also the information they were, they were protecting. I could see any one of the enemies of the United States, namely North Korea, Iran, maybe China, maybe behind this. But then again, it could be just some random Joe Blow that's, that's behind this as well. Just They're just trying to, to show off their skills and trying to wreck the U.S. government in the same process. So... Who the heck knows who's behind it? This is pretty secure, sorry, pretty sensitive stuff. But why are they using old technology to secure it? And if this is the only one, like if this is probably not the only one that's being secured by old technology, I'm sure there's a, a swarm of things that they have out there that's running Windows 95, Windows 98, or God knows whatever else. But yeah, man, this is pretty concerning stuff. There's a, a, a picture going around from, I think a few years ago, where there's like, I guess a, a media sort of, what do, you, what do you call this? It's like a media hit and it's got to do with the nuclear weapons arsenal in the States. And they're showing how the nuclear weapons are sort of maintained and would be used in the event of a nuclear uh, event. And do you know what the uh, U.S. military personnel is using to like advance the ad advance the use of the military um, or advance the use of the nuclear arsenal in case of an emergency? Do you know what piece of hardware they're they're using to get the computer to do the next thing in the sequence is it just an off the shelf 46 it's a it's a like a giant floppy disk those like five and a half inch six inch floppy disks this is this is what you're dealing with when you're talking about long-term infrastructure in the united states competent people have been raising this concern for a long time and everyone talks about you know sort of hot wars and whatnot but isn't the problem really that the United States has misplaced their priorities in terms of protecting their critical systems for the last 30 years. I mean, I have to upgrade my computer every five years or six years, basically, unless I am willing to take a chance that the hardware is no longer secure. I have to upgrade my antivirus basically every week, if not more often than that. Otherwise, I'm taking a risk that my hardware is not secure. What is the United States doing? They're flipping these floppies. They're all flipping around. floppies. They are flipping floppies when it comes to nuclear warheads, you can't tell me that this is a safe place to operate and a safe set of hardware and software. Like that combination clearly not working. The again, the other thing I would I would note, Len, is that this is not it's it's this has kind of been in the ether for a while. Like people have been talking about how infrastructure in the United States is not secure with stuff like water systems, chemical, uh chemical systems, um, I would guess military systems as well. It's funny you use the word swarm there. The, what you're seeing now too is this asymmetry in the cost 
between defending and attacking systems like this. You know, you've heard stories out of the Ukraine where uh, the United States is using Patriot missiles to try and uh, help Ukraine's war efforts, and they're being taken down by, you know, $10,000 Russian drones. Patriot missiles cost $10 million a piece, right? Th that, that sort of asymmetry exists in this world as well, in this silo. And, you know, you could guess how much it costs to maintain and run a system like this. I, I bet you it's one-tenth or one-one-hundredth the cost to, to try and take it down. And here they were successful. So, you know, other thing, Glenn, it, like cockroaches, if you hear about one breach, uh, there's probably 10 other ones you didn't hear about. So I, well, I would I'd be aware of that as well. They say that the cockroach is going to survive a nuclear attack. That's one of the, the few things. But also the other thing that's going to survive are the five and a half inch floppies. So it, it'll it. just be a, a world just swarmed with five and a half inch floppies and cockroaches after a nuclear attack. So maybe that's why they're using that. Uh, anyways, a Kreb security article is reporting that the incognito market, man, th this is an interesting story because Quite people story. are in there, they're, maybe they're going to get wrecked <laughs> in the process. So the incognito market is a dark net marketplace. And well, th this report from Krebs is saying that uh, there's an extortion going on. There's extortion tactics, tactics to try to fleece the user base. And the market is threatening to leak a massive data set containing private messages, detailed transactions, and order information pertaining to its very own users. And the incognito market has set an ultimatum for users to pay a fee by the end of May to prevent the information from being made public. So we're coming up to that in just maybe, what, two months and change. And the extortion fees, they range from around $100 to a whopping $20,000. And this number is being determined by the vendor status within the marketplace. The more prominent you are, it's going to be a higher cost that you're going to have yeah. to pay to have this information wiped from their systems. And the extortion scheme comes after the incognito market of abruptly shut down their operations and it left users no way to access their funds and all that stuff. Talk about a rug pull. And this incident, they installed fear and panic amongst the users, given the fact what they were trying to do over there. Now they're going to be strong armed into paying in some cases, a hefty fine, hefty fees to prevent the exposure of their identity and potentially incriminating information. Um, you know, if you're going to play with fire every once in a while, you're going to get burned. The people in there, let's be honest, they're maybe not the most honest people. Uh, so, you know, you're going to deal with people like this. Is there honor amongst thieves? I'm not saying that they are, but let's put them in the same category as them. It's up to you to decide what's the answer to this. And here we go. A bunch of users are going to get rugged. I suspect they're still going to, they will get paid and they'll probably still hold that information ransom over them for later on. Why would they wipe it from their system? Say you pay them 20 grand to, to wipe it yeah. from their, and their, why would they not say, oh, you know, a few years from now, you know what, we have this. We have uh, some bills to pay. Let's use your information to help pay these bills. So, you know what, this thing is going to haunt them for the rest of their lives. We we uh, we uh have we've talked about these honeypots in terms of like government in, in the past, but this is a wild one because literally all the stuff on this website is probably illegal, I would guess. Like it's either illicit substances or illicit services or illicit products. Like there's just no way that any of the stuff that you're buying on the dark web with cryptocurrency is going to be something you could grab at a CVS, let's say, you know, if I had to guess. And the other thing I, I thought was interesting about this land, they're not actually even going to the people who are making the purchases. They're going to the vendor shops. So you have like all these little sort of nested honeypots inside this greater one. And there's nothing you can do if you're someone who's been buying, I don't know, like if you've been buying like uh, drugs from the, from these guys, I don't want to say any specific drugs because we'll probably get, you know, nicked on YouTube. But, you know, if you've been buying drugs off these guys, what what choice do you have if the vendor you be, you've been buying from doesn't want to pay? Like you're toast, right? You're cooked. And uh, on top of that, you know, it, the best part about this is, uh, you know how they got this information, right? Because people relied on the auto encrypt function in the chat service that the dark market was apparently providing. Well, guess what? It wasn't providing it at all. It's all stored in plain text. And now all your communications, in addition to your address, in addition to your purchase history, in addition to your crypto transaction history, all there for everyone to see. Brutal, brutal, but not a surprise. Right? Not a surprise. You got to be careful with who you give your information to and where you're chatting. That's why we talk all the time about these services that are open source or proven to be secure for the moment. You know, Signal, Telegram, all these things. You can't can't be using you know incognito markets auto encrypt feature. That's like a recipe for disaster. This is why when I signed up, I used the name Pablo.
Nice. Nice. Yeah. So if you want to talk to me, we'll move forward. Refer to me as Pablo. <laughs> Linux users. Well, it looks like they are going to now have to deal with a new variant of a malware that specifically targets Linux systems. And this is a successful exploitation that's uh, of the development of something called the Nurbian, Nurbian rat. It's a Trojan uh, remote access, cross-platform remote access thing. So Nurbian rat. Hey, you know what? It, it, it's kind of a spin on Debian. I'll give yeah. him a little bit of kudos on that, but I'm, still it's going to be like a one. Yeah, I'll give best. it two. Maybe play. It's kind of boring. Oh, rat's so overplayed at this point. Well, that's pretty good, pretty darn high. Uh, but either way, the, this malware is um, so it's a derivative of the Nirbian rat, and so that's as I mentioned, it's the remote access Trojan. The people behind them are called the Magnet Goblin. Now that's a four there. for me. That's a four for me. Magnet really, Goblin. Magnet. I think that's great. Very creative. Oh. Yeah. I, you know what? I, I, I was going to give it a one. Anyways, <laughs> apparently this malware, the Nirbian rat, has been in the wild for two years, but it has since been adapted. More specifically, and in this case, the new known variant is called Mini Nerbian. And this that new malware that's been adopted in Mini Nerbian, it adopts to one day vulnerabilities to deliver their custom Linux malware. And these tools have operated under the radar as Linux, for the most part, lacks the scanning tools that Windows has. So mm -hmm. threat actors, they could target areas that could up until now has been left unprotected and probably will still remain unprotected moving forward. So that there's a problem. There's the perception that Linux is safer than Windows and Mac OS. The reality is it's only as secure as the user that makes it. You have far more control with Linux to secure it, but you have the e same amount of control to make it as in unsecure as you want. There are options available to you to try to secure things. You could run UFW. That's a firewall. You could run, um, gosh, I forget the name off the top of my head that prevents people from logging into your system. So after the fifth try, it logs you out. I, I forgot off the top of my head. I forget it. I'll mm -hmm. remember it shortly. But either way, there's lots of little things you could do like that. But also, you have to employ good privacy hygiene. When you're downloading something, check the signature. Also, just don't click on stuff and, and install it. You got to be very very careful in what you're doing regardless of what operating system you're using if it's linux if it's mac os if it, it's windows you are the you are responsible for the privacy re with respect to that so this zero day thing they're recommending sorry this one day vulnerability thing it, it's another reason why you have to also update all the packages on your system by keeping them outdated you risk running for somebody to take advantage of that and finding a loophole and gaining access to your system so here you go. Number one, don't download stuff. Mm -hmm. Number two, check the, the signatures. If you do download it, make sure everything is legitimate. Number three, run a good firewall. Number four, make sure that if people are trying to hack into your system, you're blocking them out after a certain amount of tries. And number five, continue to update your stuff. If you don't do all this stuff, you are going to get wrecked in the process. Eventually, it may not happen today, may not happen tomorrow, but this is a recipe for disaster that will eventually come to fruition. Agreed. The... Uh... The Linux community, I, you know, I'd, I'd be curious. I don't have much to add on this, but I'll ask you. Is this something that caught the Linux community kind of by surprise? Like, everyone talks about this thing that you just mentioned, that, like, there's just no viruses and, and stuff circulating for that ecosystem the way that there is on Windows and Mac. And as a result, there's not, a, like, a clear antivirus solution or a malware solution floating around out there. H how much discussion is going on about this right now? There is some, there are programs you could run antivirus for linux they just don't tend to be widely adopted now mm -hmm. i just remembered the name of the, the program that prevents you from logging in it's called fail to ban it's uh, a system a program you could install and it can prevent users after like a certain amount of tries prevent them from getting in they're locked out but it, um no like there is uh operating sorry there is uh antivirus programs you can run for linux just typically we don't run it and there's a reason why is the Linux community is rather small. It's mm -hmm. very limited in terms of the reach and number of people using it is rather limited. So people writing programs to attack Linux users, they're they're not going to be able to get very much because it's a very small number of people that are using it compared comparatively to the number of people that use Mac OS or Windows. So it, I don't think many people are concerned about it. This is my opinion. I just think people need to continually put forth good hygiene practices. If you don't, regardless of the operating system, you're going to have problems moving forward. Right. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. What's, uh, where do you want to go next? We've got two more to go. <clears throat> well, this is WordPress. 
plugins. And there's a malware campaign that's currently underway, which exploits the vulnerability in the pop-up builder WordPress plugin. And the malware campaign injects malicious code into the websites to redirect users to phishing and scam websites. Now, just on the surface, you can understand how this is a, a serious concern for both website owners and users <coughs> and visitors as well. And WordPress site owners should keep their plugins up to date and scan the site for suspicious code. And they're saying this is going to help mitigate the risks just for being targeted by these malware campaigns. Now, if you're an easy DNS customer, you could simply go to the WordPress administration page. And from there, yeah. you could update your stuff. So that it, I would recommend for anybody listening that if it's not an easy DNS customer, you always suggest moving forward. But anyone that is an easy DNS customer, check your WordPress admin page, make sure everything is up to date. And that's the way you should continually work moving forward. Because these hacks, these attacks, these malicious code, the only way to stop it moving forward is to obviously be one step ahead and always update your software. So yeah, this is pretty crappy stuff for the most part, but there are plans in place that are available to users. Update your WordPress plugin. Yeah, not that hard, right? We we update our stuff fairly often and uh, WordPress, at least on the easy DNS admin pages, they prompt you for the updates. So it's not like you're you know wandering in the dark, wondering if you have to update or not. It tells you much like your iPhone will tell you if there's an app update. Uh, it's easy to do. You just have to pay a little bit of attention and be diligent. And, you know, as always, security is a journey, not a destination. These things are going to keep evolving and coming at you. And so it's important to stay on top of it with all your uh, sort of personal products, whether it's WordPress, your personal PC, whatever. Um, always important to stay up to date with uh, all those services and plugins. Those are the ways that, uh, you know, the easiest ways to protect yourself. You may as well do them. Another way to protect yourself is to not reuse passwords and usernames <laughs> because this next story is talking about that. It's Roku because the users in there, a select number of them got pwned. Some 15,000 user accounts were closed off due to suspicious activity and the money was refunded to those customers as well. 15,000 users seem like a lot, but Roku has over 80 million active accounts. I'm not sure how many are paying accounts, but if there's a decent portion of that, 15,000 is pretty small, but it, it, certainly, it shows off why you should not use the same username and password. So the unauthorized yeah. access was granted by hackers who used username and password combinations that were obtained from breaches of other services. <laughs> and they used that to log into users' accounts. So they were able to get these information from other breaches, realize that you know these the username and password is the same. They keep just trying to, to try it out and it works. And man, recycling old username and passwords is not a good, <laughs> it's not really good for you in the, in the long oh, run. Oh, sir. And Roku mentions that Access to the affected Roku accounts do not sorry did not provide the unauthorized actors with access to this is really good did not provide them social security numbers full payment account numbers date of birth or other similar sensitive personal information so in that respect it's good that that information did not end up in these attackers hands but in the flip side man people out there please use better passwords, use better usernames, don't recycle this stuff. If you do, once one gets hacked, then you could reuse that, copy and paste that over and over again and get access to all your information. Again, the onus is on you. And if you're not going to do it, nobody's going to protect you in the end. Smooth finish to the story here, to the uh, newsletter. I mean, it's not that hard. Don't use the same password over and over again. I think many of us were guilty of that in the early days of all these online services, but there's no excuse now. Good on Roku for catching a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, I'm happy to see that. Uh, but generally speaking, like the, the problem with some of these retail products, like Roku is a good example. Almost everybody who has a smart TV has a Roku, you know, avenue, right? It's not like you have to seek it out. It's on your TV. It's a button on your remote a lot of the time now. And so, you know, th these guys are, are really, they're, as a company, they're targeting sort of the lowest common denominator in terms of user base. It's not really a comp it's not really a complex user base, an advanced user base. And so you'd expect to see stuff like this in that user base. So maybe they should just warn people before they sign up, like, hey, don't use something you already used, uh, blah, blah, blah. This is a, a new era in password uh, and security. So anyway, that was uh, Access of Easy for this week. If you want to sign up for the newsletter, like I mentioned, accessofeasy.com. Uh, Head over to EasyDNS for all your web hosting and DNS needs. And uh, don't forget to sign up on YouTube as well. And until next time, take care of yourselves. Yeah, cool.